These hungry silkworms are eating their way to sustainable fashion for Switzerland. Their owners are venturing into sericulture, breeding silkworms for Swiss silk. It's really fascinating to watch the whole cycle develop. You rarely see that in such a short time with any other agricultural product. The idea is to produce homespun sustainable fashion in Switzerland. It could avoid the huge carbon footprint caused by importing silk from China. I hope my generation and future generations can bring about change to produce more sustainably and locally. Ueli came up with the idea of breeding silkworms, which are actually caterpillars, the larval form of the domestic silk moth. The lab space he needed for his experiment was rather testing for his family at first. He was rearing his silkworms in our bathroom, over the bathtub. Our daughter and I, well, we didn't find it that practical. <laughs> Ueli and Bettina resolved the conflict by moving their silkworm trays to the garage. The humble origin of many a grand project. I'm a farmer, but I have no land. That's always a problem, right? So I decided to focus on special cultures where you can produce a lot on very little land. I'm also a textiles engineer, so silkworms are a good match. It was partly out of necessity, but it's also fascinating. It's really fascinating to watch the whole cycle develop. You rarely see that in such a short time with any other agricultural product. So it was a combination of necessity and fascination. This is the sound of 12,000 hungry caterpillars munching. The idea of making money from sericulture was a bold one, especially in Switzerland. Silk is actually from China, where production originated thousands of years ago, Bettina and Ueli had to face resistance from a powerful lobby at first. The reactions from the textile industry were mostly negative. It's crazy, it will never work, it's just a hobby. It was mostly negative. But over time their attitudes changed. Of course we're niche, we're very niche doing this, but we have revived the idea of making silk in Switzerland again. Not everyone is talking about it, but some are. The silk yarn they spin is destined for the world's catwalks. Fashion designer Raphael Couto, a star in Switzerland, is a strong advocate of Swiss silk in the textile industry. He's showcasing his collection at the Swiss Design Awards in Basel, the leading national design competition. For years, Raphael hunted down the best materials in the archives of museums and companies. He decided on Swiss silk. Silk is a great material to work with, and it has something special compared to other fabrics. I prefer to work with natural fibers and materials, or to upcycle old materials and leftovers. In 2019, Raphael won the award for fashion and textile design. At the Swiss Design Awards, sustainability has become an essential criterion. This is a silk shirt. It's vintage silk, 
produced in Switzerland and everything is dyed by hand. It's gorgeous. Silk from China is out of the question for him. Thousands of kilometers of transport means a huge carbon footprint. As a top designer, he's given Swiss silk a name. But the silk has also given him a name. I was lucky enough to win several different awards and I was able to set up my own studio in Zurich. This collection, for instance, was developed during the pandemic, so this is the first time I've been able to display it live. I also made this video to present my work on film because there were no opportunities to hold an exhibition or fashion show. Mulberry tree leaves are the silkworm's favourite food. Experiments feeding them other types of plant have all failed. The mulberry tree is robust, but there is one challenge. Silkworms are so sensitive because they've been specially bred for thousands of years purely to create silk. They're sensitive to insecticides, of course, but also to fungicides and other chemicals. They make the caterpillars sick and kill them. This is also why sericulture is not possible in many places, or only under difficult conditions, because insecticides can drift from large apple orchards, for example. These chemicals settle on the mulberry leaves, we harvest the leaves, and the silkworms get sick. Silkworms are voracious creatures. It takes 450 kilos of mulberry leaves to raise his 12,000 silkworms. Ueli often has to bring in new supplies. Many of Uli's neighbours are traditional farmers, such as Peter Balmer. His cows produce milk for cheese, a classic Swiss product. But unlike many of their colleagues, he understood the silk project right from the start. If you talk to historians, you will hear that silk was produced in Switzerland many years ago with silkworms. Lee has founded a silk producers association called Swiss Silk. So far, 11 production sites in Switzerland have joined the association. He hopes the project will grow. Swiss Silk it was important for Swiss Silk to set a regional example which would extend beyond Switzerland and include nearby European countries, where a complete supply chain could be built up. This would mean far less transport than usual in these times of globalized trade, where silk comes from China or Brazil. We're not trying to save the world or turn the whole system around. We're a small niche, so that's not our aspiration. But we can set an example by producing silk locally to avoid greenhouse gases. Ueli is meeting a farmer in the picturesque Simmental Valley in the canton of Bern. China managed to defend its silk production monopoly for many centuries. In fact, it was a state secret, which was systematically prevented from spreading. It wasn't until 552 AD that silkworm eggs finally reached Europe.
Yannick Richener is interested in silk production too, but is not sure whether it will work with his business. The first step has worked out. The tiny eggs, the size of poppy seeds, have hatched. I saw a picture in a biology book and I said to my wife, hey, that would be something different, something new. And that's how it happened. That's the reason we decided to try it out. Yannick's first attempt at sericulture has worked, but the issue is now finding a space to rear more than 10,000 silkworms. The garage is occupied. Would the cow shed be an option? The cow shed here, in terms of space, would be really good. You could just put a breeding tray down here. You need a constant temperature of 21, 22 degrees Celsius. That's the one thing. The other is the hygiene issue. Is a cow shed suitable? You have to try it out. The third thing is access. How easily can you get there to feed the caterpillars? My recommendation is to always have a breeding room where you can go in your pyjamas before bed and bring in fresh leaves if necessary. It's the easiest and most efficient way. In terms of the workflow, it wouldn't be such a problem. It's always a bit more difficult in the evening just before you go to bed, when you're tired and you still have to tend to the animals. But it's the same in the winter when a calf is born. It doesn't care that you want to go to bed. Um. Yannick would have to plant at least 120 mulberry trees for the silk production to be worthwhile. His farm is at an elevation of over a thousand meters. Yannick wants to know whether the mulberry trees could survive the winter. There are different varieties of mulberry tree. The variety I would suggest is the one we have now. They can tolerate up to minus 25 degrees Celsius in the winter. Janina Gruberman's livelihood also depends on silk. She creates fashion from Swiss silk and other local raw materials. Janina trained as an engineer in the construction sector, but decided to move away from building sites to the fine fabrics of fashion. Whenever I went to a store to buy something, I was always disappointed with the quality. I wondered about the price. I could buy a T-shirt for five francs or euros, but how does that work? Then I saw all these videos about the accident in the Rana Plaza garment factory in Bangladesh, where so many people died. And I just thought, at what cost? Her concept is slow fashion, the opposite of throwaway consumerism. Her fashion also sells at higher prices than clothing from Asia. If we produce high quality clothes, we can wear them longer. That means we produce less waste. 
We can even recycle some parts, or we could even compost the silk, for example. It's a small contribution. We can't even measure it yet, but at least it's something. The idea of slow fashion is catching on. After some initial difficulties, Janina found business partners and customers willing to pay the price for sustainability. Swiss silk from the canton of Bern has made its way back to Zurich. In 1881, a silk weaving school was founded here to train specialist workers. However, by the beginning of the 20th century, the Swiss silk industry was unable to keep up with international competition. Today, new craft workers for the highly contested market are being trained again in the textile college. I think it's really important that people learn to make things themselves again, that expertise comes back to Switzerland. It can be small things like mending a zipper or re a hem. For many people, that's already a challenge. But if the trend catches on and people start sewing their own clothes again, they'll gain in value. People appreciate the textiles more as a work of art or as an expression of individuality. Seamstresses are relatively rare in Europe. Women are often exploited in low-wage countries and there is still a massive pay gap between men and women. But the debate about climate change could alter consumer behaviour. I hope my generation and future generations can bring about change to produce more sustainably and locally so there is something for everyone and every style. The CEO of the school, Sonja Amport, shows the trainees 19th and 20th century Swiss silk prints from the previous school. Here you can see various patterns that were printed on silk fabrics. They're of a really unique quality. It's almost impossible to do this today. These prints were celebrated in the past. We don't have so many printing works today, but there are still ways to produce silk from start to finish in Switzerland, and also with ready-to-wear fashion. For many ready-to-wear companies, the costs were just too high and they outsourced. But there are still small companies with between 10 and 30 staff that still produce in Switzerland. Digitalization offers an opportunity to reduce production costs. With help from machines, the higher wages in Europe are less of a factor. This could bring industries back, which will be beneficial. The pandemic highlighted Europe's dependency on supply chains. To ensure that silk has a future in Europe, the trainees are learning to get maximum use from the material and create as little waste as possible. With digitally controlled laser cutting technology, waste is virtually eliminated. Silk is a very valuable material, so I don't want to throw away any scraps. For example, with the sleeves I sewed, I didn't just throw away the fabric I cut out. I attached them to this piece as leaves for decoration. Silk is a natural fibre, and the issues of sustainability and being nature-friendly are big topics right now. People are living more consciously, they want to buy less plastic. That's why I think the silk business in Switzerland can definitely grow.
Before the material gets to this stage, it's already been through a lengthy process, like at Uali and Bettina's silkworm farm. They're watching out for the moment of maximum growth, before the caterpillars start cocooning. They need space and distance to do that. Silkworms gain a lot of weight as they eat, putting on 10,000 times their original weight. Eventually, they reach the maximum size. When they get to five grams, the larvae start to spin their cocoons. We know that they're gaining about one gram per day right now. So tomorrow, or the day after, the first caterpillar will start spinning its cocoon. As long as the caterpillars keep gaining weight as they eat, everything is fine. But Ueli and Bettina had a major setback when they started out in silk production. We lost some at the beginning. We picked the leaves and brought them into the caterpillars, but they got sick and we didn't know why, until we discovered that insecticides had been transported through the air and landed on our mulberry leaves. We picked the leaves, fed them to the caterpillars, and then they died. It was awful for me because on the one hand we lost our caterpillars, but on the other, it's terrible how insecticides penetrate nature. It's not just the silkworms that were affected. It's true that they are more sensitive, but all kinds of insects are affected. For me, it was a real eye-opener, that in the long term we're not heading in the right direction. Christoph Hobie dyes the woven Swiss silk. Customers choose their colour, then he mixes it especially. Silk is a demanding fabric. For the dye to stick to the thread, Christoph has to add acid. This ensures that the dye chemically bonds to the fabric. As a dyer, I like all colors. What I'm personally not so keen on is brown. For me, it's a non-color. Generally, I like strong, bright colors. Christoph works alone here. He runs one of the few small dye works in Switzerland which suits local Swiss silk producers. Large dye works do not accept their small orders. I specialize in small quantities, and that's what Swiss silk has. So they're very happy that I can dye small quantities for them. The silkworms are so fine. When you have them in your hands, it feels very pleasant to hold them. After 24 days of feeding, the caterpillars have had enough. Their bodies signal that they have sufficient energy and material to enter pupation and spin their cocoon. Each individual silkworm is placed by hand into its new home. Since the silk producers only have to look after the caterpillars intensively for a month, sericulture makes for a good sideline.
aber das beginnt sich vorzubereiten. They're getting ready to cocoon now, when they start searching for a spot like this one. They're very agile, which I like to see. They start spinning quickly, and they don't lose too much silk thread when they start to form a cocoon straight away, instead of searching. That's really great. The others will all be in their little boxes in the next few hours. Finally, I'm losing patience. <laughs> The result, 12,000 caterpillars spin almost four kilos of raw silk. Woven, that makes 40 square meters of fabric, which Ueli and Bettina can sell for about 3,200 euros. That gives them an hourly wage of around 23 euros, more than many farmers earn per hour. The cocoon is hardened by the caterpillar's dried out saliva. The thread softens in hot water. The pupa inside is killed by the heat. The cocoon is unwound on a so-called decoiler machine, which Ueli imported from India. He learned to operate this machine in India, a craft long forgotten in Europe. Once Ueli has wound the thread onto the bobbin, his work is done. Each cocoon has about 0.3 grams of silk on it. The length of the silk thread varies between 600 meters and 2 kilometers. All of these elements coming together, the individual cocoon threads feeding into one, and then this silk thread on the bobbin. After all the hard work with the trees, the caterpillars and drying it out, it's a uniquely wonderful moment.